Hello, everyone. Welcome to Taking Care. I'm Meredith Goldstein from Love Letters, the advice column. Uh, Taking Care is a series of talks with mental, mental health professionals um, that we set up during these very scary times. Uh, I just want to start by thanking a local company, Jaspi. They're our presenting sponsor for the talk today. Jaspi is a family finance app that has a lot of education for kids. Uh, so they wanted to help put together today, which is going to focus specifically on family and children and all of the things that are so far out of my realm because I am childless and single and have to entertain no one uh, during the social distancing but myself. Um, so, you know, I started the series saying that I wanted to do this because we all need help right now and we have so many wonderful mental health professionals who can help us but i want to also give the disclaimer that this doesn't count as official therapy um you know the, the people we talk to aren't seeing you individually they can't make diagnostic recommendations but this is a really good starting point to have conversations and to just bounce ideas off of each other and to hear from someone who sort of knows what we all might be experiencing We've had two installments of this series already. Uh, the first was with Dr. Monica O'Neill, who talked about relationships in general during quarantine and isolation. And, and then we talked last week to Dr. Drea Letamendi, who is a, a, a psychologist who focuses on pop culture and talked about healthy escapism. So I highly recommend you check out those other episodes. But today we're gonna talk about families and kids. Uh, we have the wonderful gift of the presence of Dr. Ellen uh, Broughton, who is with MGH, and she's gonna help us with our many questions. Uh, Dr. Broughton, can you just start by telling us where you work and what you do? Because it's all so wonderful and helpful today. Yes, so I am the co-director of the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds, which is an online resource for parents. I'm also a pediatric neuropsychologist at the Learning and Emotional Assessment Program, where I'm the executive director. and. I do, as part of my work there, uh, evaluate kids for all kinds of learning and emotional issues. So what I'm gonna do today is ask some of my own questions on behalf of people with children in my life. I'm gonna ask many questions that were already submitted by readers. And I just wanna let everybody know that if you have a question in the moment at the bottom of your screen, you see the Q&A portion, um, you can absolutely leave questions. And we're gonna try to field as many as we can in the next hour. Um, so. I just want to start with my own question, which is that there seems to be a big conversation about schedules. And when this whole quarantine and homeschooling uh, period started, I would see a lot of Instagram photos made by friends with kids, a whiteboard, the schedule from 9 to 9.30, we're going to do this. Um, and I think that a lot of parents begin to feel like if they're not meeting the demands of their own schedule, they are failing. So how, what, what should anyone's expectations be for schedules right now with children? Well, first of all, there's, there's no failing in something that we don't even know the rules for. So it's impossible to fail right now because we are making our own rules as we go. I do think though that the concept of schedules is an important one for kids because they need schedules. They just need to know what's coming and especially at times that are really difficult where they we, we really don't know what's coming down the, you know, but at the end of next week or next month, you don't know if school is going to happen. So to be able to schedule their time during the day is really important. That being said, I think that sometimes parents set themselves up for failing basically their own uh, goals. And I think that you've got to talk to your kids about what they expect from a schedule, especially once they reach the age of like eight or nine, they should be having a good idea about what would work for them on a given day to get their work done. But I also think that parents should be thinking creatively about schedules, like maybe this is the time to sleep in a little bit later and start your day at 10 o'clock and have a great breakfast with your family and then start on your schedule. So I think being sort of loose, I kind of think about what would be kind of wonderful right now? There's a lot going on that isn't. So what would make a day really wonderful for all of you and make that your schedule? But at the same time, that consistency is important. So I applaud parents for doing that. It's, it's absolutely necessary. But I think we can sort of think a little bit more broadly about what a schedule really is at this particular time. I want to talk about um, something a friend recently said to me. I was talking about young people, and by young people I mean teens into early 20s, who are having a tough time staying indoors, who don't completely understand, you know, the significance of, you know, how important it is to observe these rules. And of course, we saw those early scenes weeks ago of people going on spring break. And, and this friend said to me, please forgive 
the, the early 20 somethings. Definitely forgive the teens, but absolutely forgive the early 20 somethings because what your, your own brain does not sense danger and truly um, understand what it is until you're actually past 25. And because this friend is no kind of doctor or scientist, I wanted to ask you that question. Is that true that, that perhaps some of the behavior uh, we've seen in younger people who might be taking risks that in my 40s I do not want to take, is it because the brain actually can't process what, what all of this means? Definitely. So the part of our brain that is responsible for what we call executive function skills, our ability to organize, plan ahead, sense danger, know when to, when to move and when to move away, is the, the prefrontal cortex. And that doesn't really develop until we're well into our 20s. And so that's one reason is that that part of our brain that allows us to see the big picture is not quite all in place yet. And it's, it's different for different people, just like we all develop at different ages in terms of how you know, our growth charts. So there are some people who are 20 years old and they have had, you know, they have very good uh, development of that part of the brain. And then there are 28 year olds who don't. So it's, it's definitely a biological sort of thing. I also think too, that it's important to think that it's also a psychological sort of thing that this is an age, this teens and early twenties, when you're looking at your peer group, this is, you're looking to others and you're stepping away from the boundaries that your family put into place. So this doesn't feel natural to them either, that there's this biological reason and also the psychological reason that together make it really hard for a 23 year old to think like, well, why can't I go to the bar? Why can't I just play pickup basketball with my friends? So it, it, there really are true biological reasons for that. We have a reader question, um, a reader I will not name, even though she gave me her name because I just want to protect her with, from her children. <laughs> she says she has daughters who are nine and 24. And even with that age gap, there's sibling rivalry and fights. And she's basically tired of managing the conflict, which is so um, intense right now in the same house. And we had a few of these questions about uh, simple fights that are now that much bigger between siblings because everyone is so boxed in. What would you say to a parent who has to mediate all of this? So for one thing I would say is to sort of let it go a bit and let them kind of figure some of this out on their own. I also think, in, especially in this case with a 24-year-old and nine-year-old, again, so, some of those same reasons that we were just talking about, it's going to make it hard for the 24-year-old to be at home. She or he wants to be out. They are, that's their developmental task of that time period of their life, and they're not. So they're probably feeling very closed in, um, maybe even a little bit sort of depressed, maybe anxious. And then the nine-year-old wants to just play and be a regular nine-year-old. And so I think that empathizing a little bit with both of them, and this goes for all parents, just empathizing that it's hard for them too, and as individuals. And I think that one of the things you can do is just sort of spread them apart, give them both space to just be and allow them to not even be together. I think that for some of us, this idea that we're all in the house together means we now all have to get along. And you know what? There are introverts and extroverts in every family and they need to be able to have their own space to be able to do what they need to do to feel safe and secure. You know, we keep bringing up teens and this difficult time they're having. And, you know, I just keep saying, I have lost my fear of missing out because I'm not missing out. There's nothing to miss out on. Everybody's home. Easy to say at my age, for young people, they're often missing out on these moments that we remember. That I, you know, I remember my prom, I remember graduation, and you know, these young people aren't getting those experiences. So how can we show empathy and let young people know we really get it? And what do you do with a teen that's like just really miserable right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is from anecdotally and just talking to a lot of families, this seems to be hitting teens particularly hard because the teen years are just, there are a lot of memories that happen in the teen years. And it's important to have these markers in our lives, graduations, proms, um, you know, even exams at the end of the year, they're markers for us that give us, that sort of organize and structure our lives. And so I think empathizing with the fact that they might be grieving right now, some of those things, they might not think of it as grief or even label it like that, but it probably is somewhat that. And also I have a feeling it's like that for some of the parents too. And 
it's probably not being expressed in that way. And I think it would be very helpful to talk about some of those things together. But I think validating their feelings, validating their um, disappointments, listening to their worries too, and just hearing, talking about loss to them. Like there are a lot of things that have been lost and what are they and, and, and how can we make up for that? And I think that um, it, the kids watch us for clues on how we're handling that. And if we don't talk about the fact that graduation isn't happening this year, they're feeling like, well, maybe it wasn't that important to begin with. So I think that we've got to find a way to create some kind of rituals for them, either now or talking about the future with them, because I think that the sense of loss sort of permeates a lot for them. And it might also, talk, uh, might also get into this idea of um, the sibling rivalry, especially, especially when we're talking about different age ranges and why it's really hard because kids are going through different things at the same time in, in the same um, house. You know, you talk about grief and I want to bring up a very sad question we received from someone who asked about young people under 10 dealing with a loss of someone to COVID um, and how to process that grief. And, and one of the things that made me think about was that ordinarily, if we lose someone, it's our experience, the world gets very small and people can come to our aid, they can comfort us, um, and our experience is unique. And right now, people who are losing friends, family, especially young people, like they can't grieve this in normal ways, they can't get support in normal ways, and the rest of the world is very preoccupied with their own losses. So what do you advise for parents who are they themselves uh, coping with loss, but also helping their children who've lost someone to this? So this has to be one of the toughest questions I've ever pondered. It, it is really mind boggling because all of the things we know about loss, like you were saying, don't really apply here. All of the things that we do to help ourselves get through a loss, we can't do. That is reaching out to others, having a ritual, a, a, something that marks this occasion is something really important in our lives that gives a, us the opportunity to express our emotions in a way that's that our, our culture sort of values and validates. So I think um, one of the things to, to do is to reach out as best you can to others via you know, mediums like this and to talk a lot about how this grief might go on for a longer than it normally would, but trying to reframe that a little bit in the fact that in the future, we're going to remember dad again, that this is not, this is not the, the end of things. So I think that that can be very frightening for kids to have something like this, to not have a marker, to not have this sort of collective grief that's very helpful. Um, and so I think talking about what can we do that would honor dad in a way that is really just particular to him. This is an opportunity for us to really talk and think about what would dad love. It could be a trip to your favorite place that you went as a family. It could be gathering people together in August or next year or whatever. But thinking about the future while talking about the present, I think is what it needs to be done. Um, and it's, it's hard to do. And it's hard, especially to get through your own grief if you're a parent grieving about your spouse and then also trying to to make a, a you know these sorts of decisions and talk about these very difficult things with your child. So it's also important for you to get your own uh, help with this. And this is one of those cases where I do think there are a lot of support out there from psychologists and, and therapists and social workers who really want to help. And so even if you don't have a therapist, this caught, caught you completely unaware, to reach out and see if there is support out there because we might find that there are grief support groups out there for times like this. You know, there, there may be things that are being put into place as we speak to help support people who are going through this very, very unique time. And just to that reader who wrote in who did talk about, um, you know, children losing a father, I'm, I'm so sorry. And I, I can understand uh, just the isolation of this experience. And thank you so much for writing in. Um, I, I want to talk about something that is a little bit, I see the irony in this question because for every week we do this, I think about the privilege I have of having a laptop, having the technology to talk to someone like you, um, 
last week we talked about escapism and entertainment and I realized that I have many channels who are my friends right now. And in some families I'm seeing a real divide between people who's, uh, people who have so much technology to help with school, um, kids who have video games, kids who don't. And I think that's probably obvious to kids too, you know, what they have and what they don't have. And it might be more pronounced, you know, how do you have those sort of conversations about uh, finances and um, access and the unfairness of, of the world? Um, and on the other side, what can, you know, is there anything families should be talking about to consider what they should be grateful for? Yeah, I think being grateful for what we have, and we have an awful lot. If we are healthy right now, we have an awful lot. And I think that that's important. I think that just facing some of those conversations in a way that you just said, but in a developmentally appropriate way. So we don't want to, at this point, overwhelm kids also by making them feel guilty that they have things. Not to say that we, we really should um, acknowledge our privilege and that many kids and families don't have what many other kids have. Um, but I also think we don't wanna go down too far down that road right now, unless we can help kids figure out how to do something about it. So find an organization that's offering free internet service for a community or find a way to contribute something. That helps kids not feel so stuck. And we don't want that guilt to sort of turn inward like, well, what's the use? Or So we want to, if we have those conversations, we want to already be prepared to say, so yeah, here's, you know, we should be grateful for this. Not everybody has this. So what can we do to help somebody else? And even if you don't have the finances to help somebody else, even doing things like writing a letter to somebody who lives in the neighborhood, who's alone, something that says, you know, we have something somebody else doesn't have. And so we're going to fill that need for someone else. I think it also gives kids a sense of purpose and a real sense of sort of mastery over these feelings of feeling like they're helpless. Uh, Mary H. writes in, uh, are there stages of adjustment to the crisis of being homebound as there are stages of grief? Definitely there are because there are stages for almost everything that we go through. I can't tell you right now exactly what they are. And I think that it sort of will depend on how long this goes on. So if this goes on for four months, which I hope it doesn't, and no one has said it would, uh, it, I think it's gonna be very different than if it goes on for another two or three weeks. And I think we'll look back and say, yeah, you know, it took us a little while to get into a routine. And that's probably the first stage I would say is just like dealing with the, the, just the amazing differences that you have to happen in your life. And so after you sort of adjust to the fact that we're going to have to adjust to this, I think that we're sort of in that next stage where people are like, okay, got to do this for a while. How do we make it work for us? And then once you start to do that, then that's where you start to see some of the, you know, sort of the problems that happen when things are, you know, you put something into place and it, of course, it's nothing's ever going to work perfectly. Um, and so some people might be entering into that stage where it's like, okay, I adjusted with this idea that we have to do this. I put some structure into place and now my structure needs to be changed. And how do I do that? So I think that that's probably where we are in a way. I don't know what's coming next, but maybe, you know, a lot of people are just sort of, you know, kids are very, very adaptable and resilient and they, they will adjust to a lot of things. I think it's we as adults who are having trouble adjusting. And in a way it's because we have more than just schedules to worry about. We have finances to worry about. We have jobs to worry about. We have lots of other things that um, we don't want to interfere with our kids' ability to adjust, but we're having to deal with at the same time. Well, you bring up a really good question. I have, you know, I think the instinct of a parent uh, is probably, I'm guessing, to protect children, to make children feel good. And this idea that they're actually pretty good at making changes quickly, this resilience. You know, I have friends who've moved from one house to another to be in a safer place. And the kids are like, oh, well, this is where we are now, you know, or now we're, you know, living with grandma oh. now or not. And, and so should, should we be, should parents be focusing more on self-care as opposed to self-sacrifice for the sake of, of young people emotionally? I do think so. I think that we cannot sort of pilot the plane. You know, if you think about the parents as the pilot or the you know, person driving the car, we can't do that unless we ourselves are in control. 
And so, and the kids will definitely pick up on our ability to manage in a crisis. And this is one of those times that they will really, really learn what you're doing because they are around you an awful lot of the time. So yes, I do think that self-care is really important for parents. Kids really just wanna know uh, just a few things. One is, are they going to be safe? Are the, and are the people around them going to be safe? And I think, you know, there are no guarantees in life, but you can talk about that. We, you know, and kids understand that too. They know that they're moving to be safer. So for them, oh, oh, that's great now. I know that's taken care of. We're going to be safer here now because we went to grandma's. And, um, and so, and they can see that you're doing something to keep yourself safe. And they want to know that there are other people around them that are keeping them safe too. So if you're kind of fulfilling those things as a parent, you're doing an awful lot. In, and then at the same time, take care of yourself. <coughs> because if you're not taking care of yourself, that's when a child's gonna get pretty anxious about, oh my gosh, the people around me aren't safe. So what does that mean for me? I wanna ask a question from Anonymous. And, and by the way, just reminding everybody, there's that Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. So if you wanna submit a question, absolutely do that in real time. Um, from Anonymous. My husband thinks his job is more important than mine. We are both home with three kids trying to work, clean, feed the kids. What suggestions do you have to keep the balance between husband and wife? And of course, I'm seeing this through today's lens of all of this is happening in front of three children. And I imagine that um, division of labor among parents, um, you know, I, I know that I am very conscious of of Zoom calls with colleagues who has children with them who doesn't. Um, you know, who's getting a break and who's not. Yeah, yeah. So I, my guess is that this is not a new thing to anyone's marriage when they're complaining about this. And so I think this is an opportunity for you to bring up some of the things in, a, in an empathic, thoughtful way that are probably already there. And again, kind of looking at this as an opportunity, I don't want to like sugarcoat this at all, but to say that, you know, probably if this is existing now, it was, it was existing before. If it wasn't though, I would still say the same thing, which is to empathize with their fears. I'm guessing that, you know, a lot of it is maybe gender roles, um, just maybe have to do with finances or just how a different couple navigates their careers. However, it could also be bigger than that. It could be in part due to anxiety on, on the spouse's part. It could be because he's worried that if I don't do this, I am going to lose my job and without my job, we are nothing and, you know, so I think bringing this up is it, it just not like, oh, you didn't do this and I, you know, I'm feeling this, but to really say, you know, I'm feeling this, how are you feeling about this? Why is this happening and, and how can we make this better? And, um, and doing it in a way that sort of, you know, put the, let the kids watch a, a movie and go and, and talk in a quiet place by yourself and to acknowledge that you're feeling anxious or whatever you're feeling and to be able to listen to the other person on what they're feeling. And I think keeping it as a, at a sort of feeling level, I think is really helpful at this time. We had an interesting question from someone who has a child with some history of obsessive behavior and sees some patterns now with hand washing, just um, constant hand washing you know, I read the question and I thought, I am also constantly hand washing. We are all supposed to be doing that. Is there a moment where there should be cause for concern about the things we're doing and having children do to protect themselves right now? So it's really normal if someone is already sort of predisposed to OCD tendencies for something like this that makes you anxious for those tendencies to reappear. And so don't, uh, you know, don't, worry about it in terms of you've done something wrong or they've done something wrong. I think OCD behaviors often come with a lot of shame around them. So I think one of the things you want to do is to not give your child a feeling of shame about this when you bring it up to them. It's really normal for lots of us to feel a little bit obsessive right now. And I think that one of the things you can do in the short run is to sort of keep away from some of that news, even a little bit of that can sort of trigger sort of an, an, you know, an obsessive sort of tendency in someone to, to compulsively wash their hands. So keep the background noise down a lot. I would say when it's cause for concern, 
is when those hand washing behaviors are interfering with lots of other things. Like they can't come to the dinner table because they're washing their hands or they can't sit at a meal to do that. They're, they're constantly talking about it, doing that. And then I think it's time to reach out to someone for some extra support in that because there are lots of great cognitive beha behavioral techniques that can be used medication if it's if it's at that sort of point and i'm not saying it is but i think that there are lots of things we can do when you're seeing that it's really becoming more than just a behavior but i think also acknowledging it in a way that is not shaming and to just say boy you know i'm washing my hands a lot and i see that you are too how's that feeling for you do you you know and just sort of opening the conversation about it empathizing normalizing it that for a lot of people this is normal right now and then seeking help when it when you really start to think like oh this is really um, becoming a, a real problem and depending on the age of the child you can also say does, does it feel like it's a big problem for you right now or do you feel like you've got it under control because most kids with OCD will be able to say I feel like I can't control myself and so that's when you know you need to, to get some extra support you mentioned background noise and how it might affect people. And last week we had a conversation with Dr. Letamendi about screen time. And I had a feeling that because she is a pop culture person who thinks a lot about what we get um, from entertainment and specifically superheroes, she's a, a Batman person. And so many parents are worried about too much screen time with kids. And, and I asked her what she thought about that. And, and she was very specific about contextualizing screen time and calling it what it is that it's a different thing to watch TV than it is to play a video game. It's a different thing to be on a Zoom call with a grandparent than it is to be doing schoolwork on a screen that we can no longer just say screen time and mean one thing. And I wanted to bounce this off of you because I think um, there is that guilt, right? Uh, you know, friends of mine who are saying, I put my kid in front of Mr. Rogers and walked away. Is that okay? And I think, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Mr. Rogers, is. It, it, that sounds like a great... Uh, activity. Um, so what's your take on screen time, how to define it, and what works? So I think the idea about looking at it as not just one big thing is brilliant, really, because you're right, we are asked right now, our whole lives are, re are revolving around screens, whether you're a student, whether you're a working professional, um, whether you just want to connect with your grandparents, and whether it's, it's a computer or a cell phone, you're doing every, all of your social networking on screen. So yes, there is a, you really need to sort of delineate what those things are. I think that you've got to set some boundaries with kids about what kinds of screen time they're doing. So you need to sort of chunk out, so the video game time. There are some kids that I know who would spend the entire day playing video games. And so you've got to be able to say, let's look at the different sorts of things you need to do. And let's look at what has to be done. How much time is that gonna take? Let's look at how much time is reasonable to play video games. And most kids actually do have a good idea about what's, video, what's reasonable. They don't necessarily wanna do it, but they do have a sense of what would be reasonable. And for most people, you know, one or two hours a day is probably adequate. And, and then, um, because I'd rather see kids either doing things socially online or, or even just watching some shows with their parents. And I think that that's something we don't very often do as a culture. Like you don't often see families going to the movies together or talking about a film together. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to do some of those things. Show the movies that you loved as a child or a young adult with your kids and talk about it. Like this is a great learning experience to talk about, you know, what did that character feel? And how did that, story come out and why do you think the author did it that way and how could else could it have been i mean there's so much discussion you can have and then also watching educational things with your kids is great too these are all sort of what we call screen time but i think it's a it's a wonderful opportunity and i think that the only thing to be cautious about are those kids who tend towards sort of being obsessive about screen time or video games. It's actually a very small percentage of kids, but if you've got one of those kids, it's something that you've got to really be thinking about. And sometimes even seeking help if you find that your child is playing video games 10 or 12 hours a day and it's affecting their behavior, uh, calling and, and getting some support in that uh, is important. But I think really talking about what are the kinds of screen times how do we make it more of a family event? And also to say, if you put your child in front of Mr. Rogers for a half an hour, it's totally okay. Totally okay. 
how do you decide what information a young person can have about what's happening at any given age? Like, you know, you think about news and what we're exposed to, and I'm scared by headlines, and then the headlines change, and sometimes the news is um, better one day than the next, but uh, are there benchmarks? Um, knowing that every child is different, are there benchmarks for when kids can process information at different ages and how much actual news they should be exposed to? Yes, so under about the age of 13 or 14, really as little news as possible right now is the best idea. And for young kids, but they all know what's going on. So, so you, the first thing you wanna do is find out what does your child know? Um, really get it, hear about, ask them, you know, what do you know about this? Or what are you hearing? Because even your seven-year-old who's online in school might be hearing things as well. You wanna correct their misconceptions and as an adult, even though you want to turn off the news for them, you need to be informed yourself as an adult and a critical evaluator of what's going on in the news so you can be honest with your child about what's going on. So for kids under the age of like, let's say six, seven, I think all they really need to know is they're safe and you're, you're keeping them safe and everybody in the world is doing as much as they can possibly to make sure that the whole world is even safe, doctors and nurses. And that's really what they need to know is that you are in control, you're keeping them safe. For that middle age kid that like eight to 11 years old or so, they have some really concrete, this is an age where kids really start to think about, you know, they like to understand about how blood works and how the brain works. And they're really interested in all those little details. So getting a little bit of, into that is okay, not in a way that's going to frighten them, but to say, you know, yeah, viruses happen. And, Sometimes they can be very open to sort of talking about this in kind of a way that puts them a little bit, you know, defends them against the scary stuff. Because when we kind of make something real, it can become much less scary. With adolescents, this is really a time to have conversations about the big issues in life. Like, how do we handle pandemics as a world, as a society? What decisions do we make? What kind of things do we want to set up in our, in our future? It gets them thinking about, you know, they're the kids who are going to be fixing these problems for us. So start to have those really deep conversations with them about what they think about all of this. And, and also again, correcting any misconceptions. Sometimes kids, even adolescents can be thinking things that are just not true at all. So again, you wanna be informed yourself as a parent. Um, but I think that yeah, kind of thinking about these three sort of chunks of ages that, you know, the young kids want to be told they're okay. The middle chunk of kids want to be want to talk about this in sort of a concrete way, and the older kids want to be, really be able to talk about this in an abstract way with you. And I think that it's a time to sort of share. Well, here's how I feel. How are you feeling about this? I think that can be very important. Um, we have a question also from anonymous. Um, how do we talk to seniors graduating from college about their future? No commencement, dream jobs might not happen. What do we say to them about their future lives when we don't know ourselves? And this is, you know, high school graduation is one thing, but for someone entering the workforce right now, um, I, it must be very daunting to think about when does it even begin? When are the opportunities going to be available again? I think this is, it really is just, I, I, it's mind boggling to think about what um, students that age have to go through. I think that acknowledging that we are not sure right now is important. So not sort of saying like, oh, it's all gonna be fine. Well, um, but at the same time, it, it probably is going to be fine, but we've got to put some things into place that will allow us to do that. So, you know, feeling down, feeling like, oh my gosh, this is hopeless is okay. And it's okay for a while. And then you start to say, okay, so, so what are some options? What, and an option might be, you know, I'm gonna take off six months and just, you know, provide childcare for a neighbor or something, or it could be, I'm going to get online, I'm gonna look at some jobs that are out there, I mean, people still are hiring. And I think that um, just acknowledging the grief, and again, this is, a, this is something that's sort of like, we, we have this idea, we went to college, we're gonna get out, we're gonna get that first job, it's gonna be so exciting. And then to have to move back with your parents because of this, and it, it, it's, you know, it's filled with sort of loss. So I think acknowledging that, but also, thinking creatively about where to go from here can be very helpful that there will be jobs again. And how do you prepare yourself for that? And also, you know, in retrospect, we might, things will get back to normal. And we might sort of say, boy, we had those six weeks of our life when we could have read a lot of books. 
and we could have gotten informed about, you know, what would be a good career for myself. There's lots you can read about that will help you sort of feel, figure out career paths and everything. Do something like that. Do something that's pleasurable right now. If we can't find that perfect job, then we can do something to make ourselves feel better and to educate ourselves about what we might want in the future. We have a question about um, from Anne who talks about her kindergartner uh, who doesn't want to do any homework, just has no interest. And um, we also had a similar question from someone who has older kids who, you know, they're supposed to be doing some sort of online class and she looks and they're on YouTube. So what's what should be the enforcement of this? And especially when you talk about somebody who is five or six years old, I mean, is this something to worry about? So I'm just going to be very realistic and say that no, it probably isn't. And I think that this is, there's a lot of reasons why a six-year-old might not want to do the work. It could be too hard for them. It could be that they're anxious about it. It could be that it's just not that much fun. It could be that they'd rather be just reading a book with you. I think for a six-year-old, the best thing you could do right now, any, the best thing anybody could do right now is just read more books. It, none of us read enough anyway. Read books, read books with your kids, read lots and lots of books. That will be better than almost anything they could learn in the next four weeks online in kindergarten. So do something and don't let your child off the hook. Like don't say, well, okay, if you don't wanna do it, I, but say either you're going to do this or we're going to read now for the next hour or we're going to do something. So it's, you don't, you don't wanna give them the opportunity to just do nothing. And you need to figure out what would be the most appropriate thing for them. I also think that for the older students, it's, it really can be very difficult to, to keep working online. I mean, I, I find that it, it's sometimes kind of exhausting to be on Zoom calls all day that like many of us are on, and yet we're expecting our eight-year-olds to do this all day. I don't know why it is, but it, it's, it's exhausting sometimes because I think it gives you this sense that we're actually communicating, but no one's actually there to communicate with. And it's all on this, this flat screen. So I think talking to your, I forget how old that child was, but talking to them about, oh, well, so what, what gives here? Like, why don't you wanna, why don't you wanna do this? And saying like, there's certain things that have to be done. And if they're not done, here are the consequences. And it may not even be the consequences, well, you know, you can't ground anybody now, but say the consequences are when you do get back to school, it's gonna be more work or whatever. But to think about, you know, logically, if you don't do this, what's going to happen? But then again, I also think that if there are some things, and a lot of schools are doing optional kind of work, which can be really tough for these sorts of kids who are kind of a little bit iffy about doing the work anyway, if it is sort of optional, say, well, okay, it's optional, so what are we going to do instead? And again, reading, I think there are lots of great educational um, videos that, that you could watch with them, but then they better be talking about it and not just vegging out and just watching it. So I, I think that taking control in some ways and knowing what is absolutely essential, what some schools it's like, this has to be done. Some schools it's sort of like, this is you know, negotiable. And so I think figuring out that and just being very conscious of what you're doing. I think that's the, the thing that I, I should have mentioned earlier with all of these sort of things, being conscious about what we're doing and why we're doing it with our kids helps them understand that again, we're in control. There's some structure to this. It's not just like a free for all and everything. And here's how we're going to manage that, I think is important. We have a question um, about thoughts and suggestions for parents of kids with disabilities. We're trying to work at the same time as providing care, cooking, cleaning, schooling, and kids with disabilities can't do stuff on their own or online sometimes. And, um, you know, I imagine that these are situations also where there might be um, ordinarily a community of helpers that are not available right now. Yes, this is a very tough question. And it's even unclear legally what the school is required to provide at a time like this. As a parent, I would um, very much encourage you to advocate for special services um, for your child at this time, whether it's they need occupational therapy or speech therapy or special education support to really advocate that they're getting that at this time. I feel like it's, it's important for them to even get a smaller um, time of, of, of correct education than to be sort of like bumbling along for six hours in, an, in a school day. I'd much rather see kids who have learning differences get some really targeted support for their learning issues. And so I would encourage parents like that to contact their school special education director 
their teacher, their what, whatever the, their child needs in general, to ask if that could be somehow accommodated for them. I mean, legally, they are entitled to those accommodations. There is some talk that maybe that will go by the wayside, which would be terrible. But for right now, I would really encourage them and advocate for them to do that. And I also think that kids with learning differences oftentimes learn in different ways. And we've got to start thinking about there are lots of things you can be doing at home with those kids that actually meets their needs better. So teaching math by cooking with them, um, talking about how to plan a day in a calendar by actually planning it out every day and, and following it. All of these things that you can be doing at home with them sometimes meet their needs much better than what they'd be getting in school anyway. So building things, cooking things, talking about measurements and, and amounts and all those things, it's teaching them great kinds of skills. We have a comment from Anonymous. Um, there's a lot of talk about filling time, but what recommendations do you have for those that don't have a moment of peace? My husband and I are working full time and trying to balance time with our 2.5 year old. By the time he goes to bed, we have to get more work done, go to bed and repeat the cycle all over again. And it reminds me of an editor um, at the Globe, who I will not name, who recently said, well, I get half as much work done in twice as much time. And you know that's because of parenting responsibilities and home obligations that you know she had to take care of. So um, you're right, there's, there's this other end of the spectrum of it's not about filling time, it's about finding a minute. Right, right. I think in a two-parent family, I think maybe dividing it up is the only way to go. And I think that we're all connected all the time. So we're always doing emails all day long. I think you might have to figure out a way with your work to say, I'm on from 12 to eight and the other parent is on from you know seven to 12 or whatever, I think might be a, the best way to handle that. Because I think what frazzles people out is when you're not feeling like you're doing a good job as a parent, and you're not doing a good job as you're doing a good job as an employee, you, you're feeling frustrated all the time. So in that case, I might ask, you know, I might tell them to maybe see if they could figure out a time where it's really one-on-one -on -one time with the child, the other parent gets to work, and then vice versa. Um, dividing that up, I think, might be the, the best way to do that if it's possible. If not, I think that thinking about putting some structure into your two and a half year old's life you might have to use some videos. You might have to, you know, um, just have times in the day where you're taking a lunch break and, and playing with the child. And, but I also think that, you know, kids have been around parents for centuries while they've been working and they've had to occupy themselves. And I think that we have sort of forgotten that, that we sort of think that if there's a two and a half year old, we've got to do something with them. Whereas for centuries, from the beginning of time, two and a half year olds were just tagging along while their parents were doing their work. And I think starting to think like that, like, okay, I've got my two and a half year old, you're, you're going to have to do something. Like you've got toys here, go do something. You can sort of train them to do that a, a little bit. I think that we have this sort of guilt, like, oh my gosh, I've got to be doing something with them. And, um, and it might take some work. And again, if this only lasts for another three weeks, probably, you know, by the time you teach that skill to your two and a half year old, it, it might be, you know, a moot point. But I think that um, it's something that you can start to think about is how do I have my two year old kind of taking care of herself? Um, not, you know, making her own dinner, but, uh, but, you know, being in the room with you playing while you're working. I think that sort of teaching her about that is okay. You know, I think I said this last week, but I, you know, I had a single mom and I was, a, you know, what they called a latchkey kid back in the day. And I think this is such a, a Gen X take on it. But um, at that point in time, there was no other option than to sit me down in front of a TV. And um, I just keep telling people I turned out fine. <laughs> I know. I, I exactly. I watched a lot of TV and I still love to read and write. And, and my kids did, too. And so I think it's what they're watching on TV that's important. And but I think that, you know, like there are lots of writers who, who will say they spend a lot of their childhood watching TV. Well, of course, like TV is about stories. And I think that we, like stories are really important at times when we're feeling overwhelmed and unsure of ourselves. So it's not so bad to gravitate towards that, but you want to be sort of filling your mind with things that are kind of illuminating or, you know, enhancing your mood and not bringing you down too. But I, I, I really don't think 
I mean, we don't want kids in front of the TV for 10 hours a day, but I think that it is okay to, to be doing some of that right now. I also just want to say, and I know I cannot speak for all single childless people, but I'm, I'm going to say something that, you know, I've been looking for ways to help my friends who have kids who are also balancing work or perhaps they've lost jobs and they need the time to process that and to figure out um, what they're going to do about it. And I, you know, if you have people who do have time in your life, um, you know, I've got the kind of time where when I have a free hour, it's just me and my anxiety. So, um, you know, that's the time where I can be on the phone with a friend's kid. It's a time where perhaps I can be chatting with a kid on Zoom, talking about a video game, talking about what they did that day. And I, I think to call on a community, you can still do that, you know, just from, just from afar. What a wonderful suggestion. I mean, that's, that's so, it's brilliant, really, that there are lots of people out there who are kind of lonely and wish they could do something. And yeah, it's such a, that's such a, a great way to think. And kids love that. I mean, kids love cool adults who, who don't have kids and who are just like really into them. They, they love that. So yeah, I think that is important. I want to talk about grandparents. Someone wrote in a question about how kids of all different ages can be there for relatives who might be more isolated because they're older right now. And I, I want to build on that question. I, I spoke to a friend the other day who's in her 70s and she was talking about just truly missing her granddaughter who's three. And she said, I, I can't even see her from a distance because at, at three, she's no one's going to be able to stop her from running to me. And seeing me will actually be more traumatic for the three-year-old because she won't be able to run to me, you know, because she's not going to be able to understand this boundary, this sort of bubble that's between them. So, you know, that, that's a, that's a two-parter. What can, what can we all be doing and kids can be doing to support older relatives? And also, you know, at what point, you know, is it better to see someone through a window or not at all? How does this work at different ages? I think the window thing is, is very much particular to that child. So you know your child. So in this particular case, if a parent's saying, I think it would make it worse, it probably would make it worse. For other parents, it, it's fine. A three-year-old is just like, easy come, easy go. They're like, hey, grandma, bye bye. I don't have that. And so I think that you know your child, so, so target it for, for that. I think that using the internet and using you know, phones and to, to do FaceTime and that sort of thing is important. I also think that doing things like with a three-year-old, making pictures for grandma, um, doing, a, you know, like taking pictures, doing a video, all of those sorts of things make the child feel connected with the grandparent and makes the grandparent feel connected too. And the grandparent can do that too. And so I think anything you can do that would, that's doing something. I think that the, the difficult thing right now is being bored or helpless. And both of those things are just recipes for depression. And so we don't want to do, you know, if we're starting to feel bored or feeling helpless, like, well, what can I do? Like, what would interest me right now? And even if you're sort of like, well, I'm not as interested as I used to be in reading or whatever it is, do it. Because it's still, you know, it's sort of like a muscle. We'll use it and it will um, help us feel better, most likely. So I think like thinking about that and then, um, you know, getting some sort of ritual into place. So whether it's like on Sunday, we're going to have dinner with grandma on the computer and we're all going to sit down at the same time or playing games with them on, there are all sorts of apps where you can play games with other people. I think doing that sort of thing and, and sort of like making it some, in some ways sort of into a schedule, like, oh, we know, you know, we're going to see grandma on Thursday night we're going to play this game with them or whatever it is. But I think kids like to know that there's some structure with that. I live in a building with, you know, a few units. And the other day, um, the grandchild of one of my neighbors had left a joke in chalk that we could all see from our windows. And now um, I am like waiting for the next joke, you know, like to wake up in the morning to a child who'd written out a, a, a joke in chalk was just like the best. And I see chalk or, you know, I think the globe did a story about, friends, you know, young people leaving chalk drawings for each other. So um, I just love that too. So oh, there are all sorts of these little things that just like you see on Instagram, or whatever, it's just like brings tears to your eyes. And, you know, like doing things like that sort of reminds me like doing a parade in your car past grandma's house, like decorating the car or something like doing something that, you know, just think creatively about what would be fun where you're doing something and then also surprising someone else. I think is, it's just a wonderful thing for the person who's surprised and the one who does it. 
What does it mean when a young person, uh, a very young person, five, six, seven, begins to talk about um, this virus in play, you know, playtime? I have a friend who talked about a child saying, well, you know, I'm making a Lego force field against the virus, or I'm, this is the cure, or, you know, is this a concern? Is this a good thing? What is, what is that about? So kids work out their anxieties and their frustrations through play. It's really a good thing. And so if you're seeing a child like, you know, building a fortress around the virus, or, you know, like, they're going to like be superhero and get the virus and that's great because what they're doing is they're facing their fears through play. It's a fabulous thing to do. And that also reminds me that I think that building in time for free play every day is an important thing for most kids, especially little kids. And their free play should be a lot on their own. Like, again, we shouldn't feel as adults, we've got to be right there playing with them. We're not going to play the same way that they do. We're not going to think about building a fortress around something. We'd be like, oh my gosh, don't do that. Like, that just sounds like crazy, but it really isn't. It's really normal for kids. And so I think it's wonderful what they're, what they're showing you is their unconscious is kind of dealing with this in a really appropriate manner that helps them work it out and helps them feel some sense of mastery over this because that's what they want to feel like. I have some sense of control over something. Of course, we don't, but we all want to feel like we do. And, and we do to some extent by washing our hands, by doing social distancing, all of those things. And kids do it by, by playing and, and making these stories in their heads where they are the one who conquers this. It's really important. I would just add one thing, and that is if you're seeing a child do this over and over and over again, obsessively, again, getting back to the sort of that obsessive sort of um, behaviors, it's, it might be cause for concern and it's the sort of thing you might want to check out, but I'm really talking about something that happens over and over they, where they literally can't play anything else other than, you know, kill the germ or something. Um, but I think for most kids, it's really a wonderful way of working out some of these difficulties. I, I know we have to wrap up soon, but what do we know about how this plays out once the world opens up again? I, I think about myself and how strange it will be to interact with people, hopefully someday without fear. Um, for kids, when they've been given rules and then all of a sudden they're told it's safe again, what do we know about how they'll process that? So that's a really good question. In other times of trauma, and this is not, this is a difficult time because it's not like after like the 9-11 um, or the Boston Marathon bombing where there was a, a, an event that we all had to sort of process. In those times, what we found is that kids don't typically have an immediate response to grief or an immediate response to dealing with that sort of scary situation. What happens is, and in fact, at Mass General, after the marathon bombing, we were all prepared for this just rush of kids to come in to talk about their fears and anxieties. It didn't happen. We had all the, you know, this, these resources available. It was a year later or two years later that kids started to talk about this. And then all of a sudden, wow. So kids have a, kids have a slower tempo for this. So I think that they probably, when we get back to normal, hopefully, I think that their trajectory will be very different from ours. And by the time we are back to thinking like, okay, things feel pretty good now, they might be starting to then feel anxious or worried. So I think to expect this lag time to be more is probably appropriate. Um, some kids might not have any issues with it at all, and that's okay too. They may just be very resilient and go with the flow and just never mention it and that's okay. I think that um, it's so hard to know what will happen. My sense is that I my sense is that there may be more there may be kids who are sort of more prone to anxiety because this that we have this fear of something that's still continuing. It's not like an event that yes it could happen again, but we sort of know that no we've been, we're being told that Frequent hand washing is important in the future, maybe even social distancing, maybe even changing for the next year the way we interact with other humans. So I think that it's, it's, um, it's difficult to know, but I think one thing is that kids learn how to respond to a challenge by watching us respond to challenges. So the, again, the more you can be yourself ready to do that, the better it's going to be for your kids. And I imagine that's true for adults too, that you know, sometimes it can take me way more than a year to 
truly understand how I feel about something that happened. So that seems like a human thing across the board. I think so too, especially when we're talking about missing weddings, graduations, funerals, births, you know, bar mitzvahs, you know, just christenings, everything. It's like, there's going to be a sense of loss about that that cannot be captured again. Like you, you can't go back and do your high school graduation when you've missed it. So, um, so I think that, that there's going to be a lingering sense of loss and it's going to take a while for us to process all of this. Dr. Broughton, I want to thank you for, for um, joining us today because there are so many questions and, and the list grows, right? Every week I have like a whole sheet of questions from readers. I have my own questions. Um, I want to thank everybody who came today. I want to thank Jaspi, who is, um, which is a, a, the presenter of today. And I bring them up partly because I'm doing my best to sponsor local businesses and they are local and they're an app uh, for financial management for families. And they actually have a thing about allowance that I was playing with last night, despite the fact that I have no children. And um, I just thought that was very interesting and, and specific to today. Um, but I, I just want to thank you in the community. I say this every week, but like, I started this because the world is scary right now. Um, and maybe I also started it because it makes the world feel smaller to me as someone who's living alone right now. So thank you for coming today and asking questions. We will have another next week. Um, is there a way that if people want to know more about what you do, uh, the, the center at MGH, um, I'll put this in the, the, the language when I send this out as a link, but where should people go to find out more about what you guys do? So they can go to um, mghclaycenter.org and they will find a lot of information and a lot of connections to other information. Like we have lots of links to other things. We have articles about dealing with the you know kids and coronavirus and how to talk to them and and what to do in terms of their learning and so there's a lot on there it's a very good place to start okay all right well feel free to uh leave more questions and again there's always love letters um where i will answer questions that are a little bit more at my pay grade um and you can go to love letters uh it's uh, boston.com slash love letters. And there's also the Love Letters podcast, which is a great wealth of storytelling about breakups, hooking up couples and beyond. It's, I would say it's a pretty good distraction if I may say so myself. So um, we will see you next week. And again, Dr. Broughton, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.